have the focus point, but uh, today also we're going to sh show some film clips from my film. As you know, also I'm a filmmaker. Um, I was writing lots of novels um, for last, say, 15 years, but uh, this novel is the one I think I spent a really long time. Normally I'm a very quick writer, so you know, one novel I would spend, say, eight months or maximum a year and a half to finish a novel because I'm impatient and I'm Chinese, which means <laughs> that you can't really write a novel more than, you know, if it takes two or three years, I, I prefer to die, you know, something like that, you know. <laughs> my patience is so low, you know. And, uh, but this novel took me about five years because I, first of things, because I write now in, I write in English, which is my second language, and I used to write in Chinese. So that takes much longer time, twice longer than I needed. And second is, um, it's a novel I try to set both in China and in the West. And it's kind of a double love story. You know, there's two lovers in the West, in London, and then two lovers in China, from China, but exiled in the West. So the, the novel has this kind of uh, nature, like a detective novel, which I could never done you know, before. And I never know how to write a proper, so-called proper plot, <laughs> detective style novel, because I came from poet background. As you know, if you write poetry, you know, it's really you know, the beauty of words and the flow of emotion rather than, you know, way very complicated na narrative style, which I always thought belonged to some, you know, male 55 years old, at least, you know, they were good with that. <laughs> I'm not very good with that. So it took me a very long time. But, but one thing I wanted to write for years is the issue, you know, between the relationship between the, the individual artist and the political society. Because this is a subject you can imagine as a Chinese. I lived all my life, I'm 30 years in China, and then for the last 12 years I came to the West, mainly Europe, to live. And I think this question, you know, perhaps very similar, you know, for, for a Russian artist, you know, if, if a Russian writer left Russia, came to, say, so-called free world, you would have this similar kind of anxiety and a kind of kind of nearly, you know, nearly kind of personal obsession to discuss, you know, the relationship between individual and the political world, you know, because that's where we come from. You know, it's impossible to be apolitical if you come from China or Russia. So I wanted to discuss those issues in a novel format, especially have a love story kind of, you know, kind of jacket, but inside is something quite, you know, quite personal and, and uh, historical to explore. So these things are in the book, but I hope you'll find out later after I, I leave this place. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you, um, um, in the novel, the um, male character uh, seems to see the world in black and white, and the female character seems more of a pragmatist. And I was wondering whether in your mind there is something about being female mm. um, which is linked to survival, perhaps because of looking after the next generation, um, or just being more pragmatic and more linked to life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would hate to say, you know, there's definite difference between female view and a, and a male point of view, you know, but then, but our biology difference between male and female does create a secondary reality, which is beyond anything else, you know, that reality because of the, the physical difference between men and a, and a woman. And I wanted to shape a, a quite big story, you know, between men and women. They somehow, they are, they, they are they're always at war, you know, whether they are lovers or enemies. And I think when I was young, I think teenager, you know, I, I was very in love with French literature, for example, Marc Duras. And, uh, and uh, you know, that generation, 1950s, French, Italian literature. And always the idea of two lovers are always enemy, you know, whether from same culture or different culture. And I think these are the issues, you know, most of my novels, I think my last 10 books are nearly all about that, between two lovers or husband and wife, you know, there's a great war going on between two individuals and it caused from all kinds of difference, you know, cultural difference, or just uh, bottom is individual difference. Um, but with this book, I wanted to shape, you know, the man, the, ch the man in the book is a, is a musician, actually a punk musician. And I wanted to shape the new generation Chinese, you know, which is not very historical, you know, heavy-handed, you know, Confucius tradition, you know, but someone totally in love with Sex Pistols, for example, you know, listening Clash, you know, all this Western pop music, especially from Britain, actually. And that's how I, I was so 
um, I was totally you know, hooked onto those, those culture when I was 20 something. Um, so the man is really, you know, he's like the Johnny Rotten in the Chinese version. And therefore he had to exile, like Johnny Rotten has to exile from Britain and go to America. Uh, so he's very, he's really political animal and he thinks the political struggle is all, you know, we need to, to do, you know, in the art world, in the music, in the, in the book. And uh, his lover, a Chinese girl who actually in the book is a slam poetry uh, poet, you know, traveling poet. And she believes in nature and, 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 and the grand history, which is beyond human humanity. Nature and, and the continuation of life is much bigger than political struggle and ideological discussion. And in, in the end, you know, I, I don't want to give away the whole plot, but the woman survived in the book. The man didn't survive. So, so I mean, this is kind of a generic you know, perspective in my books. You know, that somehow women are, in the end, much wiser than men. And, uh, but, but by saying that, you know, I am, I think, both male and female in me, and these two sides, you know, very social, political side, fighting against my kind of feminine, you know, non-political side. And I think nearly every day, you know, I, I argue with myself, you know, in my book and in, in my film, and I want to present that battles in one person. So now in the book, it's two characters, but actually two bunch of characters, you know, one's political bunch, when it's totally sensual, love-driven, you know, love conquers all, that kind of character, yeah. Um, in the book, we have the um, Chinese characters and also the Western characters. And I felt that there was this idea of aliveness that you talk about, and part of feeling alive is fighting, is the rebellion. And I was wondering whether you think that we're kind of lazy in the West because we don't have to fight in the same way. There are not so many restrictions, obvious restrictions, to our freedom. Does that lead us to lead a more trivial life? Mm. Well, I'm sure in Google you are not lazy. I, I see you work very hard and lots of coffee uh, in the morning. So, <laughs> so, I mean, Britain, you know, Britain, Germany, you know, these countries, I think, working quite hard. I mean, as much as, as Chinese do. Um, but I think you know, the, the society, the shape of society is rather different because in China, the difference, you know, especially Britain is so typical. Britain had the last, say, 300 years of industrial revolution. You know. I mean, the Dickens novel, Dickensian time, you know, wrote about, you know, the whole industrial revolution from Victoria time. So you had 100 years to digest this kind of lifestyle, which is industrialized, you know, office-based, you know, um, and fast, you know, away from the rural agriculture life. But in China, we didn't have that 300 years of this evolution, you know, from agriculture to industrial time, because we had for the last 20 years, you know, only last 20 years, we suddenly were progressed from traditional agriculture, uh, you know, thousand years of agriculture, peasant society. We have to shift immediately, transit to a modern industrialized society. And that last 25 years, say, because from Deng Xiaoping's time, you know, our XXX leader, you know, he was the one, you know, first leader after the Cultural Revolution, decided that we should adopt some of Western style from America system and introduce the market economy to China in the end of the 70s and especially 80s. And I think from eight, 1980s until now, China suddenly, you know, kind of, you know, went through this radical change, you know, to, to modernize itself. And so I think it looked like, you know, China is the most crazy version of industrialization, but actually because the 300 years period only, you know, being compressed into 30 years. And it, I think if you understand that, then you understand, you know, the, the Chinese phenomenon, well, a bit, because I don't understand it either, you know, it's, it's really complex and it's a vast country. And also the culture, you know, what we view China now is like, you know, a communist China, but bear in mind, the communist China only from 1949 when Mao took over China, you know. Before 1949 is kind of thousands, thousands of years of feudal society, which is one emperor in the, in the imperial court, and the rest is kind of feudal, you know, peasant system. And that is, the, I think, the real deep, you know, really fundamental Chinese structure, which is also a collective autocratic uh, society, which was never, never, never individualistic society, you know, like, like most of the Western country, Western culture. So in a way, you know, I think 
I guess you know in my novel and uh, you know the peasants talk about work and uh, and, uh, and a kind of commitment to the land to the roots you know and uh, they think that you know life on the road is a sorrowful sad style you know so that's totally different yeah from from especially American modern culture you know people on the road you know the houses on the wheels so. I think these are the fundamental difference, but yet in the, in the modern society now we are very similar. You know, the, the working ethic, all these are similar. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's amazing that you're writing in English, in itself. Struggle. <laughs> but but I'm wondering if you found a new freedom in a language which isn't your mother tongue, because in a way it's cliche free, because you don't have the cliches to use a cliche at your fingertips. Mm. Well, you're right. Um, I think in the beginning because. Um, I I went through you know really kind of personal identity crisis in a way for for some years um, after I left China, which is 2002 2003, um, because when I was in Beijing, I was a fast furious writer. So I wrote you know, published about eight or nine books, and I was writing for the you know different magazine, culture magazine as culture critic. So I was very fast, speedy writer, and then I left China about 12 years ago, came to the UK. I, because I had this film scholarship, came to the UK to study film, directing, and I'm supposed to make film in the West. But then I, when I came to the UK, I suddenly, this really, you know, this identity crisis or loss of my identity as, not, o not only as a Chinese, but also just as sort of intellectual. Because I think it's not good enough to live as, as, as a citizen. It's more dignified, you can live with cultural identity too, you know, and I think most of immigrants, you know, went through very sad non non cultural identity. You know, most immigrants say, you know, Chinese immigrants, you know, Turkish immigrants, they came here as economic immigrants. So they daily life is try to just make a living. I mean, culture wise, they, they can't really write articles to express their political view, or they go to cinema, you know, enjoy a theater and a film because their life is so limited. Yeah, because with a survival survival problem. And in my case, when I came to Britain 12 years ago, I found it extremely lonely, not only physically lonely. Uh, I couldn't speak English. I never went to any English grammar school, you know. So I came as an artist, you know. And I said, well, I could maybe survive here, but, but that's not very dignified. And I wanted to survive, continue as a novelist and filmmaker. And the only way is to adopt my second language, which which is English, and I couldn't really speak at that time, let alone to write. Uh, but I decided I'm going to use my broken English to write my first novel in English. And that was a novel called A Concise Chinese English Dictionary for Lovers. And it's a very simple book. I thought it would be a disaster. You know, I thought no one going to publish it. And I would just uh, you know, be totally you know, broken, and I would go back to China to, you know, to find my old life back. But it was, very, uh, it was a big surprise. The novel is written in a very broken English, and the novel is about a peasant Chinese girl couldn't communicate with her lover in London, so she wrote a book like English notebook with all the vocabularies. So it's like a hundred vocabulary from very simple, simple words like full English breakfast or or green finger, and then and then bec each vocabulary become more and more sophisticated. You know, say you know. Pessimism, you know, optimism, you know, or privacy, you know, something more philosophical, more kind of culturally complex. So the whole book is is a little vocabulary notebook, you know, guide you through her desolation and love and uh, and her longing to to the world, you know, to basically to love. Um, somehow the book was quite successful, and I think that was really the moment I said, well. That's good, you know. I, I took that risk to write in my second language, but I, I, I could continue now as a writer. And that was a moment I think I was still, you know, have very strong kind of identity crisis because, as you ask, you know, when you write in second language, what kind of writer are you now? You know, especially you from China, it's very far away from from the West. So I ask myself, you know, I, am I a British writer or Chinese writer? So I was still living under the nationalistic kind of hat, as if national identity is your only identity. And I suffered from that crisis for years because I was writing English and I published you know, a few more novels. And then, and then life opened up because of writing and filmmaking. I went to live in Germany for two years, Berlin and Hamburg. And then I went to Paris to <coughs> live for two years. 
And I think those living around, you know, in a European different culture, different language uh, <coughs> landscape, enable me to think about this identity problem. And uh, now I think the national identity can never define an individual. You know, I think most of you sitting here probably have, you know, say, pass different passport, an Irish passport, British passport, Canadian passport, because it's really, you know, such a new phenomenon in the last two years, uh, 20 years, how individuals become so poly, kind of, you know, I think no longer you live in a one-dimensional identity, you know, you let alone, you know, if you have different sexual identity, you know, so being gay and being lesbian, being, tran you know, transgender, you've been, you know, lots of people have three, say, national identity. And I think with this new kind of way of living, and you start to think, well, I could write in Chinese or English, or one day I may be writing in French. Um, but those things, the languages no longer define who I am, and I, I am bigger than that. I am the individual who has all this, you know, poly, poly side. Um, and I think that's amazing. We can live in different dimensions nowadays without live under one hat, one rigid identity, and that's really freedom. <laughs> I'm actually quite curious when you think of an idea for a work of art, how it comes to you, because you seem to um, move not only between languages but also between media. So, you know, the novel could be a film, or the film could mm. be a novel or a poem. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, I think you, because you, you work in, in this building, I think, you know, you, you need to collect data, you know, facts. But I think with artists, I think we are. We kind of we try to live kind of opposite because somehow, you know, th those things doesn't enable me to write story with emotion. You know? So, so the way I live, I guess you know, like most of artists, you know, very quite naked. You know, we don't belong to any institution, you know, by choice or or not. You, or there's no choice. Oh, and I think really I dig a story from my own roots, which I grew up in a very peasant, remote village in China, in South China. Um, between Zhejiang province and Fujian, uh, south of Shanghai, which is opposite to Taiwan Channel. And I, I could show you some film clips because that kind of, you know, my teenager years in those monotonous little village with big line to go outside, you know. Um, and I think those years, you know, when I was young, I thought it was very depressing in a little village in a very feudal society. I grew up with my grandparents which they, you know, my, mother, my grandmother was bound to feed concubine for my grandfather. And they, you know, both of them were illiterate. They couldn't even recognize their name on ID card, you know. And that kind of very, really, nearly barbarian, you know, village feudal growing up. And then when I was eight or nine, I, I brought back to my parents, which live in another town, which was much more cultured. And my parents, present communists to China, which is against the feudal system, against the superstition, you know, against the whole thing, um, you know, concubine, you know, the old tradition. You know, they are really the generation from Mao's time. So they were very dogmatic, you know, about, you know, what's a good, you know, good way of live, you know, learn and study, you know, you know non-religious, you know. So all that is very, it was opposite to how I grew up with my grandparents. And I think that was the transit for me to think about, oh, what, what is really the truth of you know, human, human life, in a way? And I think those contradictions are in my books and in my film, and especially in I'm China. And then later on, when I came to the West, it's another kind of, you know, I wouldn't say cultural shock, because it's like cliche cultural shock, but it was, it was quite painful transition to, for me to understand, adapt this culture. In, especially Britain is so different from European culture. You know, I think Britain is more kind of, has, has somehow carried a more kind of Victoria tradition. You know, the, the continuity is much stronger, which means it's tougher for the foreigner to adapt. Unlike other culture, maybe, you know, there's a, there was a revolution in the last 200 years. So in a way, you know, might be closer to China, you know, with, with that aspect. So for me, it was quite difficult to adapt again. Um, I was thinking maybe to show at uh, the beginning, you know, several minutes of my, one of my fiction film called The Sheer Chinese. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so uh, pity we can only just see the beginning because um, it's really a film about a peasant girl gradually discover her, her 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 youth and her freedom. So in the beginning, you see her quite tough peasant background, and then 
it's quite, it, it, so her journey is, you know, she's dating different boys in the village and then one day she discovered, well, there's a huge city. So she ran away from the village dating all these modern gangsters in the big city and then she become a kind of young prostitute. And then she discovered there's a West, there's London, there's Britain. And then, uh, so it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a tough, tough, tough version of, uh, of village youth. And then, and then you see her really walking along the Western seashore kind of nameless seashore, you don't even know, you know which country is that. And uh, it's quite a bleak film, but it's very, um, I think it's this woman's physical journey, and a young woman's physical journey. It's very kind of body, body experience, but also, of course, spiritual experience too. Um, I hope you see one day, anyway. I mean, one thing that struck me about the, um, the film is just how beautiful the landscape is. And on the one hand, it looks very hard to be constantly nagged <laughs> board. On the other hand, yes. why would you even travel five mi miles in such a beautiful surrounding? Like, is there a regret, like after the escape mm -hmm. and the exile, like what has been lost? Yeah, I mean, nostalgia is, uh, I think, oh, I, th I read who, who said that. I mean, nostalgia is always, you know, you might, ha you might come from a horrible little barbarian place, but the nostalgia brought everything so poetic and romantic, you know, memory, you know, even though the reality was much harsher in your imagination or in your memory. But uh, nostalgia is something different. It's a confirmation of your roots and a kind of reconcile with your roots, which you maybe hated. You know, maybe you hate for a long time, but it's it's a value system in your head. You know, you revalue the past you have lost, and it's like you value your youth in a way. And even your youth was spent in a horrible place, but still you were young and fresh and innocent. And I think that's like it's a contradiction for this character. She struggled all the way, came to the West, to the most exciting place, and be the most beautiful woman. You know, in the, in the Western world, but but her roots came back, calling her all the time, and I made her life totally melancholic. Um, and that's kind of the spirit of this film, yeah. But even though there is so much sadness in, in your work, there's always humor. Well, I hope so, I and, mean, and, and <laughs> and <it's> <laughs> in this novel. And I never yeah. know if my reaction is inappropriate, or, or, or I don't know how different audiences <laughs> react differently to your work. Um, but I know you're going to um, do a short reading from I Am China, mm. which yeah. is actually funny. It's also terrible. But there's often that dichotomy in your work. Yeah, I hope. Well, I hope you will enjoy the book. There's a there's quite sad a bit, but but the character may be sometimes quite quite funny. Uh, but I hope so um, for you. Uh, so I uh, I'm just gonna read uh, um, a little section from beginning of I'm China, and hopefully we can kind of have discussion, you know, f more freely after that. Um, but the one thing is. I had a really difficult to write this book because, uh, you know, most of the part is from male, very angry male punk's point of view. And uh, the novel is based on the letters and diaries between these two lovers, you know. So very angry, angry young punk man and with young women. There's a young woman's side I'm familiar with, but with this angry young man side, you know, I, I couldn't really get this tone right. And I remember I was, you know, reading all the biography, you know, Johnny Rutten, or Bob Dylan, you know, or Tom Waits, you know, all these musicians' book. And I thought, well, I really have to find this voice right. But, but then they are Westerners. So, you know, the swear words, you know, all these are different, you know. And uh, the Chinese punk is something else. Actually, it's quite serious and never, maybe never swear, maybe. So <laughs> it took me a long time to get this tone. And there's a section I'm going to read to you is, um, this young angry punk man who exiled from China and uh, he was so angry he had to write a letter to the Queen of Britain um, because of his illegal situation in, in Britain. And actually that's based on my real experience. Um, I had some kind of problem with my visa in Britain in the beginning, you know, few years. But I didn't write a letter to the Queen. Luckily I wrote a letter to some important person, Sam Rushdie actually. So that time, I think about eight years ago, I wrote a letter to Sam Rushdie, and then he helped actually get, get my visa sorted in this country as a writer. And a, well, it's kind of funny um, coincidence. Um, but the letter, this letter now is, is very different, of course. You know, the situation is very absurd and nearly comical. Great um, to open the discussion up to, to everyone now. Um, so um, who would like to take the first question? Any questions? Please, yeah. So I'm interested in the microphone. Yeah. 
Um, I'm still interested in the difference between writing in Chinese uh, and English and how you would approach sort of writing a scene, you know, if you're describing a room or a character, would you choose different sort of adjectives or different ways to describe the same situation according to language? Because obviously the language is so different. Mm. Absolutely, it's a good question. It's, it's technical, but also totally emotional. Um, I always say, you know, the, the English is maybe between German and English and the Swedish, you know, maybe there's not such, I mean, you can still argue there's great difference, but between Chinese and the European languages, really, there's no real reference because we are, the Chinese language is, is a pictorial, is a, the character is written as picture, so the Western, the Western words is letter based, so the A, B, C, D, and we don't have that system. Um, so another thing is quite philosophical. When you write in Chinese, you know, we d in Chinese language, we don't have tense difference, so verb difference. Mm -hmm. And that's really painful for a Chinese writer to always try to find out what the real tense you, you are writing. But if you have a Chinese mind, if you, if you grow up in China, for you, you know, everything is present tense. You know, we say, in Chinese, we say, you know, uh, which means, you know, I, I eat noodle and I go to cinema yesterday afternoon, something. But there's no difference. So there's no difference with the verb. There's no gender difference either. If you want to indicate, you just put the, the where and the when, you know, the exact time in front of a sentence. And that's quite important, actually. And the action actually is after, after the time and space. So the most difficult thing for Chinese is past, past perfect tense, something like I had been, I have been, and you think, what? <laughs> but I am here and right now, you know, here and now. What are you talking about? And I also, when I think the, the great, I think the, the disaster, I, I, because the first two books I wrote, you know, in English, um, absolutely present tense, without being pretending I'm a postmodernist, you know, the postmodern <laughs> novelist, they always write anything present tense, even they talk about 3,000 years ago. And I wrote uh, kind of naturally, and I think created great confusion for my editor and the publisher. They said, but this is the past, and the past happened in the past. <laughs> Would you like to change to I had been in this sentence and this whole paragraph? I actually couldn't understand that. I said, but I am here now. And also, what about B generation, you know, Kerouac, you know, Allen Ginsberg? Didn't they r write in a, what's called, you know, subconscious stream? Don't they write in present tense, you know, on the road, Kerouac? And they said, no, they don't write in present tense. So some editor bought a copy of On the Road by Kerouac, showed me every sentence is in past tense. I was such a, you know, in a, I was in a shock because I thought, you know, the Western subconscious stream is always present tense. No, even B generation writer wrote in past tense. So from that day on, I was like, that's a real culture shock for me to understand, okay, everybody in the West living in the past, even you are writing the present. <laughs> so <laughs> it was totally philosophical and it's, it's, it's painful, you know, um, especially for me to form a sentence, because I never went to the, any English grammar school, you know, so I'm self-learned. So to form a sentence in your book, say, he had been painting the wall while I entered his house. Took me ten years to make <laughs> sentences like that, because in Chinese you will say, you know, he paint, he paint, you know, he he doesn't paint, you know, he doesn't paint, he he paint. So in Chinese there's no s, no verb change. He painted the house when I entered the room three days ago, 2013 or something like that, you know, whatever. Yeah. So very simple grammar, but the Chinese, the difficulty with Chinese is complicated characters. And that is tough bit. Yeah. It's quite interesting in I Am China that you actually have images of the. Um, writing in the original. Exactly, so the, yeah. You know, obviously, I don't understand what these scrawls mean, but you can gauge the personality by the calligraphy, even if you don't understand anything. So exactly. And I think that's something, you know, in China, you know, I mean, in the old days, you know, if your mother tried to arrange a marriage for daughter, the mother always say, this is a good man because his calligraphy is beautiful. And then that means he's, you know, very cultured, civilized. You know, and the calligraphy is, you know, the handwriting with a brush. How you write characters is the biggest, uh, you know, virtue, you know, biggest value of a man. And nowadays, any Chinese type, A, B, C, D, 
and then on the computer will jump out 10 different choice for the characters. You can click number five and then find the words in Chinese, you know. <coughs> and I think the com computer technology absolutely changed the culture. So you no longer write. You don't, no longer need to write beautiful calligraphy as a great virtue of a man. You just need to type A, B, C, D. And also, I think it's incredible that the culture, you know, made the Chinese not able to understand you know, the Western culture, English culture, but not the other way around. Because for us to use computer meaning, we have to understand English in order to cooperate our Chinese writing on the computer. But not you, you know, in the West, you just need to know ABCD, but you don't need to learn all the 20,000 Chinese characters. And I think that also built in a way, you know, the cultural inequality to understand each other. So if you talk about, you know, from Western point of view, it might be dangerous for you because you don't learn the other way around, you know. So in a way, you might need to learn a bit of Chinese too, in order to match the Chinese mind, you know. Um, and of, of course, you know, adjective is actually the secondary problem. I think verb is, is a huge, huge struggle for Chinese to write and to speak, yeah. More questions? Yeah, please. Um, okay. If the microphone do you need, yeah. The filmmakers. Yeah, what, what, you know, are there particular filmmakers yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love lots of filmmakers. It, it's funny because I started to write when I was very young, really 13, 14, you know, published my poems and uh, stories when I was 14. But um, I didn't want to go to university and study literature because I was this kind of, you know, very uh, calculating person, calculating person. I thought, I already know how to write, but I don't know how to make film. And filmmaking is the most fashionable thing, you know, in the 1990s, and still, in a way, you know. And I saw I was desperate to try to learn how to make film. And that's why I was in the film school in China and in the UK for 12 years altogether. And uh, you can imagine I really lived, you know, lived with those old films, especially 50s, 60s, you know, and I loved a lot, you know. Um, especially European filmmakers, you know, from 1950s, say, Jean-Luc Godard, you know, Jean Rouge. Um, you know, Chris Marker, you know, lots of documentary filmmakers because I'm very into the film essay making. But of course, you know, the Italian filmmakers, you know, Pasolini, you know, um, and also, you know, Fassbinder, the German filmmakers. But the, the older Hollywood time, which I think more or less everyone loved because it carried a good tradition in the old days in Hollywood. Billy Wilder, for example, you know, and the modern ones, of course, you know, it's, it's common. Nearly everybody loves, you know, Kubrick, for example and Coppola, all these filmmakers. But, uh, um, but my, you know, my filmmaking really, you saw those clips, they, uh, they have more kind of European identity than a Chinese identity. Because the culture, the culture in heritage I got is really the Western literature and the Western film. And I love those things, you know, when I was a teenager. So I was really, you know, that kind of modern generation grew up after the Cultural Revolution. And we were very attracted, especially European culture. Um, and I think that was the reason I came to Europe, you know, 12 years ago. I thought, why would I stay in China, make a second-hand film look like Western film? Why don't I come to the West, you know, have the first-hand education, and I, I would be in that environment to have, you know, more genuine stuff, you know. And uh, in a way, you know, th there's a negative side, you know, with Chinese literature and the cinema we are imitating the Western literature style and the Western filmmaking because the modern, the modern form is really come from the West in the last, say, 100 years. And before that is another type, another narrative, you know. So for me, it, it makes sense, you know, I'm now in the West because the stuff I like, <laughs> the literature style, the film style is really from this land rather than from the East, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? How many how how many minutes we have? Um, I think um, I think we can wrap up. Um, so thank you very very much. Um, if you would like to have your book signed, then um, Charlie will be here for you. Um, so please give a, a round of applause for Charlie. <laughs>